i år at få uh, projektlederen Mark Knight fra Most Farm projektet til at komme og fortælle os om det her kæmpe store Fenlands projekt som uh, stadigvæk pågår starter i 2004 og uh, foregået af forskellige omgange og de er også derude lige nu omkring nogle større landskabsanalyser projektet uh, kan man sige er også en form for uh, hvad hedder det, redningsarkeologi i det det er lertagning der er i det her område men det betyder så også, at det er et dyrt materiale, de får ud, og derfor har de muligheden for at få lov til at grave det her på nogle helt fantastiske måder og rigtig, rigtig spændende. Så vi vil sige velkommen til Mark Knight. Just check this. Is this working? Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to come and speak about Moss Farm. Um, I just a quick slide to put up a, an acknowledgement of the, the colleagues um, involved in the project and the organisations involved in its, in its sponsorship and, and its continuation. And also just to say that Moss Farm is a, is a landscape um, and it's also a, a site. So I'm going to talk about the Pile Dwelling Settlement today and alternatively be known as the Pompeii of the Fens in a sense that it's this settlement that gets burnt down and, and is captured in the silt and it has this sort of foreshortened um, duration. I think my real task, I suppose, is to give a sense of, of implication and from that, the thing that interests me most about this project is, is scale and that sort of sense of understanding its scale in terms of its temporality, its spatiality, its materiality, to try and get a sort of an idea of how a settlement with a foreshortened and known duration with a spatial intensity or material intensity can give us something about or calibrate how we understand the later Bronze Age landscape. And I think if I do nothing else from my presentation it will be reflecting on the implications of our project on later Bronze Age studies, and, and about this whole idea about how we understand scale in, in later prehistory. My first slide is a, is a conflation of a, of a modern landscape and a, an ancient landscape. This is a, a paleo channel. This is a, what's known in Fenland terms as, as a rodden. It's a watercourse that was, um, dates to the early Bronze Age. It was full of marine sediment and it, it sits within a modern agricultural landscape, which is now you can see with the roads and the gridded fields and things. And it's this sort of coming together of the modern landscape and the past landscape that sort of starts off our research, I suppose. But what I'm interested in is, is how the, the past landscape is now coming to the surface. So the, the peat is what's being ploughed in these fields, but the peat is denuding, it's shrinking, and the, the former landscape is coming to the surface. But you also notice that the, the Paleo Channel, this old watercourse, is where the farmsteads are built on it. You see them dotted along its line. And it's this relationship um, that as the fens are shrinking and the agriculture is in being intensified, this prehistoric landscape is coming more and more to the surface. So this is the context of the Moss Farm Par dwelling, is, is, a, is this Paleo Channel. So the peat, in effect, is, is Bronze Age in date. Now, to go to find one of these Paleo Channels, it's pretty easy because they're signposted for you. You can see in the, in the top here, we have the, that's our channel. And if you drive fast enough along the Fenland roads and things, you sort of dip into them and come out the other side. And it's, I think in a sense, this is what reassures me that we're not digging some sort of strange anomaly within the landscape. We're actually digging something that is perhaps commonplace. It just so happens that we're the first people to dig one of these payload channels in any intensity. So they look like this. So the roads dip into the top of the channels, and what this tells you is that there is no solid geology. Everything is, is peat and silt. It's this sort of soft deposits, the Holocene sequence, and it's very deep. And it's that depth, I think, is the other quality that makes our landscape or our investigation so interesting, is that we have a, a full Holocene sequence into which prehistory plays out. So it gives you organic preservation, but it also gives you preservation of context. So the context of our investigations is a brick pit on the western edge of the Fens. And the great thing about the brick pit is, is that they're interested in clays that were formed in the Jurassic. So they're 143 million years old and they're 
five, six, seven metres below the surface. So in order to extract that clay, they remove the Holocene for us. So that sediment sequence there is Mesolithic at the bottom and Iron Age at the top. And we're able to work incrementally across the landscape, basically investigating those deposits. So the two people you can see at the bottom of the section are looking at a Mesolithic old land surface, a buried soil, before this landscape became inundated. But what's interesting for us here today is this big smile at the end here, which is that same paleo channel which the roads dip into, and which we've been investiga investigating since 2009. And it looks like this. So it's about 25 metres wide, it's about 4 metres deep. It dates to 1600 BC at the bottom and 100 BC at the top. It's sluggish, it's a canal, there's, no, there's nothing dynamic about it. The, basically, it's a very fine silt, and it's forming over time. And it preserves things in, in, in spectacular ways. So we've dug 320 metres of the channel in 2011 and 12, and we found a whole series of fish weirs crossing its base, which radiocarbon date to about sort of 1600, 1500 BC. And these form chevron shapes across, across the length of the channel, like this. And these are found in association with fish traps. And we have 24 of these within that same 320 metres, and they come back again with dates that put them firmly in the Middle Bronze Age. I put this slide up really because I want to give you an idea of the, the nature of the sediment that we're excavating. It's, it's a real fine silt. There's nothing coarse about it at all. It's like Play-Doh. It's the best thing ever to excavate as an archaeologist. It leaves a lovely surface, and if you squeeze it in your hand, water doesn't pour out of it. It's dry, but what it is, it's non-porous. So all those lovely waterlogged artefacts that are trapped in that sediment are perfectly preserved. So we're constantly in that sort of process of lifting the silt and just finding these things that look like they've just been put down. And in that same stretch, we find nine, the, the, the remains of nine log boats. And those log boats occurred at the bottom of the channel, in the middle of the channel, and just above the middle of the channel. And they extend from the Middle Bronze Age right through to the Middle Iron Age. And they're all part of this sort of testament to a, a channel that is busy, and, uh, and it has all this activity going on through it. This is one of the log boats from, this is an early Iron Age boat from uh, towards the top. We call this the Cambridge Punt, you can, you can see why. But also this slide's really interesting because it gives you a sense of the, the channel itself. You can see the, where it's rained, it's filled in. So we, we feel like we're digging a channel that's still in articulation. It's still sort of, there's no, there's no truncation. There's very little in the way of palimpsest or superimposition. It's a sort of feeling that if we got a bit quicker at what we're doing, we'd, we'd catch them up. They'd be like around the corner sort of thing. It's this sort of sense of preservation that we're dealing with. And at the same time as the fish weirs and the fish traps and the log boats, there's a distribution of metalwork um, along its length that includes rapiers, middle bronze edge leaf shaped swords, and, and late Laten iron swords at the top. And this stratigraphy is a, is a sort of manifestation of that sediment being built up. So our quarry aperture on those Holocene sequence gives us that sort of vertical resolution. So there's an age altitude correspondence, but there's also this sense of we can, we can play out things in relationship to each other. The sediment intercedes. It, it allows you to, to see the, the different components of prehistory being played out vertically. So in a way, this, this image stands as a profile of our paleo channel. I could have just as easily put a series of log boats up through there or something like that to give you that same sense of sequence. So this is a channel that we excavated in 2011, 2012, over 320 metres. And it gives you a sense of the history of that, of that watercourse. To place the Must Farm Pile Dwelling Settlement in there, I'll, I'll do it stratigraphically. It sits about there, so it's sort of midway in the channel profile. And this is the, the channel profile as it was surviving within the edge of an old quarry pit that we first looked at in 2006, and which we excavated in its entirety in 2015 and 16. And the, the red sort of jam in the sandwich going through the centre is the horizon of, of the pole dwelling settlement itself. And that looks like this. So you can see what I'm trying to give you here is a sense of that here is a channel that we're the first people to go and excavate. We're only there because it's a quarry. We dig 320 metres and it's stuffed full of log boats and fish weirs and fish traps. We go 200 metres downstream and there's a settlement preserved in its 
pretty much in its sort of entirety in terms of its architectural sort of plan. So this is a channel that's very busy and it's happening throughout the Bronze Age. So the sediment that you saw being dug around the fish trap is also being dug around the, the piles and the, the collapsed superstructure of, of this building. So the edge of the channel is, is on this side and on that side is the, where the quarry has basically truncated the archaeology. So the channel is basically fl flowing from the base of the slide to the top. And in plan, it looks like this. So in effect, we spent just over a year and a half taking away the river sediment and articulating this complexity of uprights, which are basically being preserved by being waterlogged, and horizontal timbers, which in the majority are preserved by being waterlogged and carbonised. So we're dealing with a settlement that was built in a river that's caught fire and then has collapsed into that, into that sediment sequence. You can also see on, on the same slide there are sort of some lenses of deposits that are associated with its occupation, and the things that you can see in orange are distributions of things like pots and, and quernstones and artefacts and things like that. The excavation methodology basically was that we got to know our colleagues more by their backsides than by their faces. We spent most of our time dangling off scaffold, digging with the tips of our fingers, removing that Play-Doh from around the, the organic preservation and things, and trying to articulate um, the structures. So to simplify the plan, it looks something like this. So my big white slide is our warehouse footprint sat over the excavation. We dug 25 metres by 45 metres of the settlement, and we dug it in its entirety. Um, we sieved every square of the sediment through a four millimeter mesh. There's a sense of really trying to get at the, the sort of micro detail of, of this particular um, construction. If I take away the horizontals, these are the uprights, the plan of piles. Now, we don't get pile dwellings in the UK where there's not a feature that's within the sort of vocabulary of, of the British prehistory and things. So when we, we first started excavating this, we were convinced that all of our structures were going to be rectangular, that we were going to find something that looks like a Swiss lake village or something like that. But as you'll see as I go through this, this, this has a, a sort of a, a British flavour to a, to a, a European um, architecture. The other thing that we found out was that in our understanding of its busyness, this idea that there was a verticality to this channel, we realised we didn't just have a settlement here, but we also had a, a causeway that predated the construction of the settlement and that crossed the channel obliquely. Um, and it looks something like this. So these are giant oak piles. They've been reduced or converted basically into square um, uprights. They've had their sapwood and bark removed. They sunk three, four, five metres into the, into the river sediments. Um, a dendrochronological date on these gives them a construction date of the spring 1284 BC, which puts it contemporary with things like the Flagfen Causeway. Um, and it's just marching across our site and across the landscape. As with things like the Flagfen Causeway, it also came with a series of metalwork depositions. So things like this quite headed pin, um, loop, side loop spears and this rapier and this is, this is occurring sort of once every 1.5 metres along the sort of eastern edge of, of that alignment so there's a sense if we were able to find it to its full extent there would have been a lot more metalwork in its association we were then able to demonstrate that this structure collapsed um, and this is one of the big broad timbers that was spanning the tops of these uprights that's dropped into the channel and then is covered by a shell horizon which creates a sort of hiatus before the construction of the, the pole dwelling settlement itself. So if we go back to the plan and we look at what, what we had in terms of trying to understand the, the construction sequence and what was present from the uprights, trying to sort out that forest and things, the first thing that's really evident is that there's a, a palisade going around the outside. And we believe that that palisade once went around the northern side, it's just that that got truncated by the old quarry workings. And that sat within that. There's a, a series of circular structures, the best of which was structure one, which you can see just there. Um, you can see it, it in its ground plan. So I'm gonna focus on structure one to give you a sort of sense of how that works within, within the settlement plan. So here it is in its, in its detail, so with the scaffold removed. So you can see the palisade walking, running along this, this um, southern edge. You can see the, the roof timbers forming the sort of spokes in the wheel. And then you can see the, the, some of the uprights of the structure. 
and you can also see the river sediment that we've removed. And if you look closely, you'll see that a lot of the, the horizontal timbers are, are blackened by being charred. The composition is something like this. So we have, if you look at those sort of light blue posts, there are 10 oak piles forming an eight metre diameter circle with a smaller circle of six posts in green in the centre. And then if I add to that the roof rafters, it looks something like this. So instead of us finding classic rectangular Central European sort of pile dwelling structures, we found a cliched British Bronze Age roundhouse in our, in our pile dwelling. So it's this sort of sense that we have a sort of a crossover of architectures here. Now, we also did dendrochronology on the, the uprights from the settlement, and because these are basically closely grown trees with only sort of up to sort of 50 rings on them, and they don't match any reference collection that we have, so our dendrochronologist wasn't able to give us a a, a sort of felling date for them. But what he was able to recognise was that all of the posts involved in the palisade and all of the posts involved in the structures were all failed in the same year. So it's what he called our year zero. We don't know what that year zero is in terms of the dendro position. And what we also know is that the horizontal, sorry, the, the roof rafters, where they'd been charred, the outer rings had been distorted by the fire. And what he was saying was is that if that was... Um, seasoned oak, we wouldn't have got that distortion. So his understanding is, is that basically our settlement went up as one, and within 12 months it got burnt down as one. So suddenly we have a, a site that is basically built as a, as a single episode that has this limited duration with all of this material culture. So if we look at the palisade, it looks like this. So these are ash poles driven into the sediment. You can see there's bark still on them. You can see the, the tool marks at the base and things. We've done wiggle match dating on the, the, the tree rings of some of the older um, ash poles and things. And at the moment, our, our best guess is that this is, settlement was built somewhere in the middle of the 9th century BC. So let's say 850 BC, give or take 10 years either side. So we're, we're at the very end of the, of the British Bronze Age. So in our understanding of this settlement, of this construction that goes up as one and gets burnt down as one, it sits within a landscape. So it's, it's built in a river, it's surrounded on either side by the fens, and then adjacent to that, perhaps 600, 700, 800 metres away, there is dry land. So that's, that's its sort of position. What I want to do now is, is focus on the architecture and the materials and how these things relate to that sort of landscape texture. So this is the, the construction. These are these big oak piles that have been driven deep into the channel. You can see they've actually gone into the marine sediment beneath the actual freshwater channel silts. You can see that they've still got their bark on them as well. And on, on the lower drawing, you'll see that... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, there we go. So that, that's the palisade. There's the raised walkway. This is the outer ring of the structure, this is the inner ring, and you can see these are floor supports. And if we look at one of those uprights in, in close up, it looks like this. So what our wood specialist is saying, these are basically young oak trees, they're sort of 50 years old, they've been failed, they've had some extra facets added to the failed ends, the bark's still on them, the branches have been trimmed, and they're shoved into the, into the channel. And this has happened, you know, we've got 500 oak piles, we've got you know, 700 ash piles and things. So this is coming from a, a managed resource to build, to build the settlement. Alongside the, the workings of the timbers, we also find the wood chips of the actual construction. So we've got fresh wood chips sitting in the, the sediment of them actually creating those facets and trimming the branches and building these buildings. But you also notice in this image that that conflation of settlement being built and settlement being burnt down is also represented by the fact that the charred timbers are overlying the wood chips of construction. So it really is this condensed stratigraphy. So this is structure one and it's wood chips. So you'll notice that where the palisade is at the bottom, the, the plan of wood chips there, if you, if you, the identification of those, those are all ash, and the wood chips around the oak posts are all oak. And our understanding of this channel is, is that it's basically, it's full of reeds and rushes and it's acting like a big hairbrush. So anything that falls from the surface into the water gets caught and is roughly in situ. So there's a real spatial resolution to go with that temporal resolution that we're understanding about this project. 
And as well as the wood chips, we've also got the roof rafters, we've also got lumps of turf and clay that actually form the lining of the roof structure as well. So there is this sense that what we have is a building that's basically dropped like a coffee plunger. The roof has come down, hit the floor, and then taken it into the, the base of the paleo channel itself. So in excavation, it looks like this. So on here, you can see the, the wood chips of construction and the, the rafters of the roof. In that, in that condensed stratigraphy. So in a sort of diagram of what we think happened, maybe the structure looks something like this, above the watercourse, and that in its collapse, through, through basically through burning and the, the loss of the floors and the walls and this big heavy roof structures, it ended up doing this. And this seems to have happened to all of the structures within the settlement. And this in effect is what we excavated within, within the footprint of our investigations. So stratigraphically, it looks like this. So we've got 21 centimetres representing the entirety of the stratigraphy of the excavation. So when we had colleagues coming over from sort of the Swiss lake villages and having to deal with you know, hundreds of years of laminated sediments and things, they were very jealous of the fact that we just have this one layer, just give us that one story. And this is what I think I mean by scale, is this sense that I think we have an opportunity here to actually calibrate the, the intensity of materials, the quantity of material culture, the, the kinds of activities that were going on within the settlement. So if we look at the deposit in plan, this is inside the footprint of structure one, and you can see it's a, it's a, a mixture of materials. So there's charred architecture, there's redeposited clay and turf, there's material culture, there's wooden buckets and things like that. If we go outside the footprints of the structures, we get a different appearance. These are what we call these sort of formative middens. They, and they really are formative. They're just beginning in their sort of accumulation of debris. So you can see we've got things like burnt stones. We've got butchered animal bones. There are, you can see the, the wood chips of construction, again, closely underlying the sort of debris of, of occupation. And if we go back inside the structures, you'll see that the footprint is almost a proxy for what was actually going on inside the roundhouse itself. So we have complete vessels. We have wooden troughs, um, there are all these sort of provisions and implements of what was going on within the building. So this sense of that, what was up here is now down here. So our challenge, I think, in understanding this site is that we've got lots of things, and we know that from our understanding of its foreshortened chronology, that these are contemporary and they are current. And I think that's something that perhaps sometimes we use those terms in our archaeology, but often it's something we're talking about over you know, hundreds of years and things like that, whereas here we're actually dealing with perhaps 12 months. And the other thing is to understand is that we have material culture that is before the fire, so the things that are in the formative middens, which is unburnt, and then we have things that are after the fire, which is the material culture inside the structures, dropping down into the paleo channel itself. So I'm going to focus on five of those sort of materials from, from the settlement itself. So I'm going to look at the metalwork, the wooden artefacts, the animal bone, pottery, and the textiles. So to start with, we can look at some of the, the, the wooden artefacts. So we had 174 wooden artefacts from the site. So including things like these hafted, socketed axes, you can see that these have actually been caught in the fire event itself. Whereas if we go below structure one, we had a complete hafted axe, which is not charred. So you're seeing the sort of the intensity or the, the, the sort of level of detail that's coming out. And of course, what's even better with this is that idea of an integrated approach, which is that there's no doubt that the axes were the same axes that were used to make the wood chips that were creating the facets on the posts that we're excavating. I sometimes feel like I could stand up here and just click and just show you guys slides of the sort of artifacts and say nothing, because it sort of <laughs> feels like porn or something like that, I don't know. But, um, but you can see, so there's 102 pieces of metalwork. So the reason I'm putting these numbers up is this the idea of scale. I, you know, I've got 12 months, I've got a settlement that's 45 metres by 25 metres. There are five, four or five structures built within that footprint. So these numbers are meaningful. They're not just about some sort of sense of, I don't know, showing off or something. There's actually a, a sense here of density. So axes dominated. There are 20 of those from the, the entire range and things. And a lot of these have been heavily sharpened, and some of them have been so sharpened that they're almost coming through to the, to the socket. So there is a possibility that the axes themselves are older than the settlement that we were investigating. See another socketed axe. The next most dominant material were sickles, and lots of these sickles. And we've got sickles that are being made from the same, we've got pears made, being made from the same mould. Um, different types of sickles, bill hooks, gouges, lever burnishers. 
We're finding things in sets. So we had things like leather burnishers, spears, razors. And things like the razors, we, structure one had one razor, structure two had one razor. We started digging structure five, where's the razor, and then we found it. So there's this sense of the distribution and inventory of, of, of the, the households within the settlement plan. Little caches of things like trumpet fittings and, and, and spears and axes. And then elsewhere on the site, and not associated with the footprint of, of the main structures, we had um, fragmented metalwork. So this blade of a leaf-shaped sword, um, fragments of a, a riveted bucket, and there's a cauldron handle from nearby as well. And then perhaps in terms of understanding the sort of dynamics of the settlement quite spectacularly, we found a wooden bucket that was burnt that appeared to be full of fragments of bronze metalwork. So we've got a, a hoard in the making. We've got a sort of collection of metal waiting to be melted down in order to be perhaps turned into to new materials. So this brings us on to wooden artifacts in terms of things like boxes, wooden platters that are stitched, um, cloth beaters or pestles or pounders and things like that. There's, there's one of these pretty much from each structure. And then to our surprise, amongst the wooden artifact sort of list, we found a tripartite wheel sitting in a river in the fens. And I think in a way this wheel sort of stands as a, as a sort of part of the sort of paradox, I suppose, of our, of our investigation. Because you'll, you'll notice as I describe this site that when we talk about the wood that was used in its construction, it's oak and ash. When I start talking about the faunal assemblage, it won't be fen, it will be terrestrial. And just like this will, there's a, there's a sense here that although these people were living on water, their personality was very much terrestrial. So the will looks like this. You can see the axle is still present, sticking up through the, the centre. You can also see that it's also been part of the conflagration. It's been charred. And we found a fragment of a second will nearby. So there's every chance that there was a, a cart or something like that present within the excavation. If we go back out into the, the midden spreads, the faunal assemblage also surprised us. So one of the expectations always in Fenland is that people lived in the fens because it was rich and fish and fowl and that we were going to go and find this, I don't know, the Pompeii of the fens was going to be full of pike bones and, and reeds and rushes and stuff like that. Well, the faunal assemblage is mostly deer and wild boar and pig and sheep and cow. And the actual fishbone assemblage is very small. And at our current understanding, it's much more about a population living in the channel sediments rather than something that's being eaten by the people living in the settlement itself. So we've done a, a refitting exercise of uh, the animal bone. Basically, we marked it all up. We laid it out on a grid. And we wanted to basically see, can we see individual meals? Can we see the sort of within that 12-month duration? Can we see episodes of butchery and processing and deposition? And you can see on the left-hand side of this slide that we've got the the four limbs of a, of a wild boar, and you can see the sort of fragments and things. And it's just trying to reduce it down, so the possibility that at the end of this story, we might be able to say to you that they ate this number of wild boar, this number of red deer, this number of sheep or something within this duration, within this settlement, or even break it down to individual households within the settlement plan. Our understanding from the faunal specialists is that these animals are being killed off-site. So we've got a red deer that's been killed somewhere off in a woodland somewhere, and all that's arrived on site is, is the front right leg. And that's gone into structure one. We found a left front leg in structure five, and we thought that maybe they'd be part of the same animal, but they were different sizes. So there's a sense here of animals being apportioned and then parts of them coming into the settlement itself. So this is in the formative middens around the structures. If we go back inside the houses themselves, we get articulation. So the same way that we get whole pots and complete metalwork and wooden objects and things, we get articulated lambs. These are lambs that are about three months old, and some of them are actually, they're, they're calcined at their extremities, as if they were still alive when this settlement burnt down. And just to demonstrate that they were perhaps keeping lambs within the household, we've also got hundreds of carbonised lamb droppings within the footprint as well. So you can see this image that we're building up of, of this settlement. And what interests me is that it, it feels quite mundane, it feels quite routine, it feels quite ordinary. There's not this sort of sense that we're building up some sort of, no, you know, sometimes special preservation ends up being preservation of the special, and that this is somehow some exemplar or exceptional site within this, within this context. Whereas what we're feeling is, is that a lot of what we're finding, admittedly in its quantity, is exceptional, but in terms of, of its sort of, variation is very, very familiar. 
So if we go back outside into the, the middens again, lots of broken sherds. These sherds are, are basically unburnt. They're in that same deposit as the butchered animal bones. Whereas if we go back into the footprint, we get whole vessels. And we get um, bowls with food crust inside of them. We even had one bowl that had a food crust that when we took it back to be excavated, the excavator got a razor and cut into the food crust and could see something protruding into it and it turned out to be a wooden spoon. So there's this moment of sort of, I don't know, Mary Celeste or something like that, of a, a moment in time. And we've got a full range, there's a sense of a coherent assemblage, so everything from a tiny little finger bowls the size of a ping pong ball, to small cups, small jars, fine wear bowls. Decoration is very rare, this is I think one of two examples of decorated fine wear bowls within, within the project. And perhaps most spectacularly, found a big, large storage vessel. We took off the side, and inside that was a medium-sized one, and inside that was a small one. We've got the sort of wedding set of the Bronze Age that sort of delivered into the, into the settlement. And what's interesting is, is that the, it looks as if they've not been used. They're sort of brand new within the settlement context. Our pottery specialist is saying that the forms, the, the, the fabrics, the sort of uniformity or coherency and things, that he thinks that this is perhaps made by one or two hands. We have an assemblage that is basically, you know, one potter or two potters and things. This is not something that's accumulated over a, a long period and there's not a lot of change in style and things. So just like the animal bone, we marked up all the pottery, we laid it out on the floor and we spent six days sticking it all back together again, trying to get at some sense of how many vessels were present and also looking at their taphonomy, their, their post-breakish histories. You know, what's, what's happened to these vessels? Do these vessels actually demonstrate a, a duration? Can we see time played out in those? So... This is the, the refitting, you can see the... It's funny because at the start, the sandwich was dominated by small cups and fine wear bowls and things, but in the refitting exercise, what happened was we ended up building lots of these great big storage vessels, and this started to dominate it, to the point where we now see the assemblage in a very different light. So we had 2,188 shirts, and we've made around about 120 pots, 100 of which have gone to um, Bioarch at York University, where they're going to look at the organic residues inside and get some sort of sense of, of what they're eating. We evaluated 35 vessels and we asked that question, were they eating fish? And the answer came back unequivocally, no, they were not. So there's this sense again that this sort of river context is not being played out in terms of the sort of economy of the settlement itself. So you can also see there's a, there's a sort of different post-breakage histories. You can see sherds that are burnt and sherds that are still preserved in their original state and things. You can also see a sort of variation in the forms that, that we're getting. So this one here is, you know, that's, that's two centimetres, so it's, it's that big. I, I don't know what they use that for, but that could give you a sense of the sort of variation within, within the record. So the, the, the sediment that we, we excavated um, looked like this, and it was full of charred material, um, thatch and, and bits of charcoal and small round wood and things. And at first when we saw this, we thought this was a sort of continuation of it, but then when we started getting closer to this material, we realised that we were getting textiles. So this is spun yarn in a ball, um, preserved by being carbonised. So it's, we don't have any organic preservation of the textiles, all we have is the, is the carbonised preservation. So our understanding is, is that we probably lost a, a large spectrum of the textiles that were present, because quite a lot would have just gone up to ash. And the stuff that didn't burn wasn't robust enough to survive organic preservation. So we're just catching that small window in between where they've been charred enough to be, to be preserved. So in terms of the range of the, the textiles, um, you can see that's that, that ball up, up close of spun yarn. We've got finely woven uh, textile fragments that look like this, and it's all plant fibres. So it's all things like, it's, it's bast, basically, lime bast, flax, nettle, things like that. You can see the, the sort of variation of, of some of the weaves and things that are present within the site. Um, twining, and again, a close-up of the, of the plant fibres in their preservation. And then we've got weft twining with this sort of addition of, of our sort of pile and things. And so Susanna Harris and Margarita Gleber that are looking at the textiles, uh, they're used to seeing one or two fragments. And, you know, we've got 189 fragments of textiles from, from the project. 
uh, we've got knotted nets, when we, the knots themselves appear to be a sort of a must farm type or something like that, a sense of, of production. And for me, I think the most important element of the, the sort of textile fibres and fabrics, we've got plant fibre bundles that have yet to be spun. So they're processed and they're turned into these sort of little sort of, they're almost like um, ponytails that have been sort of wrapped around a, a hand and then tied off. We've got 30 of these. So there's a sense of all stages of textile production are present within, within the settlement itself. And then things like, there's nearly 20 of these bobbins with spun thread wound around them. So the sense that the thread is also being kept within the settlement. So that's, that's a sort of a whistle-stop tour, I suppose, through the sort of the inventory of, of the settlement itself and the kinds of materials that are present and the kinds of complexity. So what we're trying now is to, is to, to get at that pattern, to try and understand about the distribution of different structures and things. The things I haven't spoken about are things like the human remains. Um, there's very little. When, when we dug the structure, because it was burnt down, we took the roof off, half expecting to find sort of bodies sitting underneath and things like this, and they weren't present. There is, there is no evidence of the occupants, but there is evidence within these formative middens of common late Bronze Age burial practice. So we've got skulls or fragments of skulls or, or bits of bodies being deposited alongside the animal bone. Um, other things like spindle whorls and loom weights are turning up in the structures that also have the textiles. And there's also things like this amber bead that came out of structure one that was found as part of a composite necklace. So you can see on here that the amber bead, there's a jet bead behind it, stone one in front of it. And these things that look like sugar lumps dissolving are glass beads. And these are made from plant ash from, from desert plants and they're thought to come from somewhere like, I don't know, Egypt or Syria or something like that, Eastern Mediterranean in their origin, they're ninth century in date. It's also grinding stones. So we've got quern stones, so we've also got these flint grinding stones. And in association with this, we've got things like emma wheat and barley. Um, we've got linseed. Uh, there's lots of, basically, of what we'd understand as being the sort of standard domestic sort of plant remains of a, of a late Bronze Age settlement. So back to our plan, our, our plan of that structure. So you can imagine that each of these buildings, so you can see on here that this is... This is roundhouse one. Structure two's there, there's structure four. You can see the fan of the roofs and things. So perhaps the settlement looked like this. And that we've got large structures and small structures. And there is variation in the inventory. So structure five is full of things like punches and bronze oars and tweezers and things, which is not present in structure one. Our reconstruction of the settlement looks like this. So we think we've lost the other half, the other side of the channel. So maybe there are 10 buildings within, within the footprint. And remember that they're living in a, in a watery environment. So to go back to our section of the Paleo Channel and that sense of the sort of vertical sequence and things, in 2011 and 12, we excavated the Paleo Channel. We had the, the weirs and traps at the bottom and the Laten metalwork at the top. Well, the, the pile dwelling sits here. But we want to get past this idea of its sort of preservation and start thinking about its context. So if we go to the adjacent dry land, we go to the Fen Edge, the landscape sort of made famous, I suppose, by Francis Pryor and the Fen and Archaeological Trust and the Fengate field systems and things like that, you can see where our settlement sits within that. So it's, it's coming in in the sort of the, the final cent centuries of the, or the final century of the, of the Bronze Age. And our understanding of the architecture of, of the British Bronze Age altogether is that our buildings in the early Bronze Age and our buildings at the Middle Iron Age are all circular. So it con continues that tradition of circular architecture. But it fits within the, the period of sort of plain wear, post devil Rimbury pottery. And if I finally sort of fill in the diagram and put in the Flag Fen Causeway, you can see that we've got this sort of tie into that landscape. This is our, our location within it. So what, what I don't want to do is present you some odd site that sort of is there as some sort of freak of preservation but actually tie it back into our understanding of of the landscape so that when we do calibrate those attrition of pottery or the the number of wild boar being eaten or the 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 wear and tear of the, the metalwork and things we can apply it to our less well preserved landscapes so to move out again this is the flag fen basin um, on, a, on a lidar image so the must farm pile dwelling is just here the blue line is the Paleo Channel making its way into, into Peterborough. This is the Fengate Field Systems. There's the Flag Fen Causeway. Here's our earlier causeway down here. 
So it's part of that sort of broader Bronze Age landscape. If I move out again to a lighter image of the western edge of the fens, the big blue dots you can see here are the, the brick pits. That's Must Farm just there. And the Paleo Channel I showed you right at the very beginning, meandering through the, the fens, is this channel here. And you can see that it's one of many. And they're all got these residual freshwater channels sitting in the top. And there used to be a tradition of metalwork and log boats and things like that being found in the fens. And they got caught into this sort of overarching interpretation that they were there because basically it was all to do with ritual deposition and that we were throwing metalwork at the water as it was rising and things. And it's the possibility that what we found at Must Farm is representative of what sits out in the rest of the fens. So every summer we take students from Birkbeck College out into the fens. We follow the roddens. We punch little holes into them and just have a look. Can we see wood chips and things like that? In 2016, we punched a hole into one of those channels. The machine bucket was 75 centimetres wide. We went down four and a half metres and we pulled out a fish trap. So what I'm saying is we're pushing pins into this landscape and it's bringing out these artefacts, these features and things. So my feeling is, is that our quarry, which we were there by chance because that's where the development is actually characteristic of the rest of the fens. And if we think about the scale of the fens, and where that sits, so there's the North Sea up there, so King's Lynn's here, Peterborough, Cambridge, there's, there's our payload channel joining into the sequence. And if I pull out one more time, we can see the fens just here. So here I am in, in Denmark sharing a, a landscape of the fens, and um, thank you very much. Questions? Um, you haven't said it uh, directly, but what is your interpretation of the burning of the settlement? Is it accidental or deliberate, or who did it, or why? Or yeah, it's a really good question. Um, we have, a, we have a fire investigator working on the project. He's a forensic archaeologist. He's worked on three projects in the past four years. One was Grenfell Tower, which is a, a modern conflagration, and another is Must Farm. He's treating it as a, you know, this sort of catastrophe of, of what's happened within, within this landscape. So far, what he understands is that the fires are starting inside the structures, and that the floors and the walls are the fuel, and that's why the roofs are collapsing. What he was hoping to find was that we'd get an internal fire in one structure and then it would leap from one roof to another and then it would burn from the outside in. But so far each structure he's looked at, they're all burning from the inside out. So he's saying he feels that it's deliberately set. Now how that works in the context I don't know in terms of answering your question, but the fact that the people weren't present either, you know, is it possible that this is some event of, of I don't know, some grand gesture of, of burning down your settlement because, I don't know, the the big guys died, or whatever it is, that sort of thing. Or is it something about, you know, about conflict, about another group coming in and chasing you off and burning down your settlement like that? Obviously, these are, I'm, not, I'm not saying I can answer those questions, but we're hoping from his investigation at least we'll get at something about the dynamics of the fire event itself. Thanks. Yeah. Were all the huts households? It's a very good question as well. I think, I think we, we got ourselves slightly into that sort of thing that we, you start digging a roundhouse and you think it's a, it's a household. But then you, you've got to be careful, haven't you? Because that's, that's a sort of, I don't know, stereotype really of what we understand these structures to be. And what we did notice is that it was difficult for us to identify doorways, or you know, which, what was the orientation of the structures. But also the fact that they're all very neighbourly, very closely spaced. So there is a possibility that the household resides across the structures rather than within an individual structure. So that's what we're trying to understand through those material spatial patternings. So I can't answer that question at this moment, but, but hopefully we might get some sort of resolution. Can we see a household within the settlement plan, or is it something that crosses the boundaries of the structures? But it's, I think it's our best chance, just in terms of the, the detail that we have with the materials and things.
Um, do you think it was a normal settlement, or uh, do you think there's going on some kind of production of something? Because you said the most uh, common uh, tool were all these axes, and there were all this yarn and the stuff like this. Is this a production site, or what would you say? Because I don't think it looked yeah, like yeah. a normal settlement in a way. Maybe it's maybe it's something of of the two, in the sense that. There's something cliched about the structural plan, the roundhouses, the quernstones, the pots, you know, they, they, it fits familiar patterns, but then there's also this textiles, the, the quantities of the materials as well. Um, obviously, we don't know from our normal dry land sites because we just don't get the preservation. We can't see what is, what is standard for those buildings and things. I quite like the idea that maybe this is about textile production. Maybe they're living over water because they're retting and they're processing. And, it is, and, and perhaps also that the wealth of this settlement actually comes from the textiles themselves. And that maybe that at some point in the future we're going to find must farm textiles in northwestern France or something like that. And there's going to be some sense of an exchange going on between materials and things. So I think, I think there is some specialisation. But whether that's something that's characteristic of other settlements, so maybe it's also... You know, you know, like a cottage in industry or something. The idea that we we do make textiles, but we also farm. You know, we're competent at building our structures and all these things are being part and or parcel of the routine. So our site got elevated. It got sent up into the stratosphere because all of its amazing finds. We were told by, you know, British Bronze Age academics that we had too much stuff, and that this was tantamount to being basically, a, a, you know, obs a, absurd in terms of its of its characterization and things. What we're trying to say, I, I, someone also said to us that our site's a bit like a shipwreck. You think about some of the Black Sea shipwrecks that have been found recently. They have a cargo that's going from a destination to another destination. They tell you about things that are contemporary and concurrent. And I think that's what our site is. It's, it's, it was above water and we found it below water. And it's carrying this cargo of everyday life and I think it, that's what it's expressing for us. I think it's just that we, we haven't necessarily given that credit to the later Bronze Age societies for, for how much stuff they had. Because perhaps we're so used to finding two pot sherds in a flint, you know, and five post holes, that we're, our low oxygen has suddenly been changed by this, by this settlement. Um, I, f I feel that there's uh, something missing. Miss missing in the outskirts of the settlement. Uh, we have this settlement on, on, on water, but, but we also have cattle and, and fields. Yep. This should be something further outside, I would think. But have you done anything about uh, contemplated of uh, doing excavations further out? Yeah, so th this is a, this is a a small window on a, on a broader landscape project. So we're digging the, the dry terraces. We're digging the fen deposits in between. We're doing off-site you know, pollen analysis, trying to get at the sort of texture of, of that, the ecology of, of our landscape as well. So on the dry land adjacent, we find big watering holes full of cattle bones. We find hoof prints, but we very rarely find contemporary settlement in, in this facility. So there is a sense that they're living on the water, but they're still basically employed in the fields. Our pollen record gives a, an example of basically of mixed agriculture. So there's pasture, there's, there's wheat and barley, and there's also mixed woodland. So there's a sense there that that texture of the dry land is being reflected in the construction of our, of our settlement. But, but it is something that we need to, to tie together a bit better, I think, in terms of, of that relationship. Um, I apologize if I overheard it, but did you say anything about um, religious reasons for uh, depositing any of your fines. Uh, all these axes, do you think they were all deliber deliberately uh, deposited or do you think they were just dropped and forgotten? Uh, I think this is the, the toolkit of, of settlement. I think this is the I think maybe that complete hafted axe might have been a foundation deposit, might have been deliberately placed underneath the structure, but I think the majority of the metalwork is, was in use at the time of the uh, conflagration and has basically plummeted into the sediment. So I've you wouldn't interpret any of your finds as, as de deposits 
made for religious. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure things like the human bone fragments. I'm sure there there are going to be elements of deposition that there might be a bit more nuance. I'm I'm talking quite generally here, but but in our analysis of the patterning, maybe we'll get some some little vignettes of, of deposition caught within that, that we can recognise. I think the metalwork associated with the causeway fits your description very well, that idea of you know, metalwork being related to crossings of wetlands and being deposited into wet deposits and things. That, that, that works. But these hafted axes, I think we're going to find that their tool marks are going to match the, the tool marks in the, in the woodworking itself and the gouges and things like that. So I think there'll be a direct correspondence between the two. Maybe there's not enough time for there to be as much of the more sort of esoteric deposition within the settlement pattern. You know, it's as if they've built the thing, they've moved in with their IKEA sort of furnishings and things, and then it's burnt down, and, and then at that point is where we're capturing it. So maybe the regularity of, of, of ritual isn't as routine as the, you know, the deposition of, routine, of the routine, if that makes any sense. Sort of. Yeah. We can talk about that later. Yes. You potentially also say that if the, on the question of the burning down, if the, either the whole thing is a ritual destruction, as you said, where they leave yeah. it deliberately and leave everything of value behind, yeah. or they have to rush off yeah. and not be able to bring all the metal axes and, yeah. and then someone else burns it yeah. for them. <laughs> yeah. Just one question. Do you have um, toolkits for working bronze, for resharpening tools? Anvils, hammers, these types yes. of things. Yes. So there's a there's a socketed hammer. There's there are there's at least one anvil, um, with, which has it's been looked at, and it's got metalwork traces on on it on its edge and things. So there is that is that is present. We don't have any evidence for metal working, because that was one of the questions we asked. Really, we did um, geochemistry of the sediments and things. There is a there is a high copper register in that horizon, but we think it's just there because the sheer quantity of metalwork that's present. But, and the, but we don't have any slag, we don't have any crucibles. Um, it's, we don't think that's the reason why the settlement burnt down, because they were making metal and things like that. So, but it's just trying to get at that, that sort of nuance, I think, as well, of, of, of the working. But no, definitely, some of those axes have been over-sharpened, those sort of big splayed ends and things like that. So. Any final questions, comments? Okay, then I think there's just left to uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mark, very much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.